Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, this talk, I'm going to talk about uh, a feature with Iceberg called integrated audits uh, and how it lets you streamline uh, data observability uh, using some native Iceberg features. A bit about me, uh, Samuel Red. I'm a developer advocate at Tabular. I uh, held a bunch of different roles before, engineering roles, uh, and also did, did clinical medical research before I uh, went into engineering. Uh, but there's some info there. It's Twitter handle, GitHub, email, you know, reach out if you want to talk anything iceberg or just say hello. Uh, so to start this talk, I'm going to talk about data quality. Uh, and big question on like, what is data quality? It's just, you know, sort of a term that we throw around. Uh, and Wikipedia tells us that people's views on data quality can often be in disagreement, even when discussing the same set of data used for the same purpose. And it goes on to say, as the number of data sources increases, right, the question of data consistency starts to become significant, right? And my favorite sentence in the whole Wikipedia entry is, defining data quality in the sentence is difficult. <laughs> I think we'd all agree there. Uh, but this is what I think of it as, right? It's like, you know, I don't want anyone to look at my data and say, I'm not sure if I can trust this data, right? So data quality ends up being like a thing of tribal knowledge, right? People know, oh, this data set is good. This data set is bad. Uh, you know, we really check this data set. And usually once people lose confidence in a data set, it's very hard to restore it. Right? You usually have like V2 of the, right? This is the, the better data set. And right? so sort of build up these, uh, ways to get around uh, sort of a bad name that you get for, for a particular data set. So how do you do that, right? How do you get people to trust your data? This is a couple of ways. One, we've all done this, right? You write your data uh, to production and you say, hey, I just ran the ETL. <laughs> uh, you do the validations, right? Because validations mean different things to different people. Um, another one here that you know I've done a lot as well is you write your data somewhere else you know, your super secret, top secret database that no one knows about, and you run your all of your, your audits and your checks and everything there, you know, maybe your test DB, and then you rewrite it to production, right? Once everything checks out, you just repoint, right? And you parameterize the database and you say prod and you rerun it and, you're, you know, you do the same transformation and put it into a, a production. And, uh, you know, you can get more clever with it. You can say, oh, I've got these metrics that I run as part of my pipeline, I sidecar it and like, here's the production data, but here's this metrics table or metrics information that have maybe aggregations or other type of data quality things. Maybe you run analysis with a separate tool, you dump it somewhere else and that your downstream consumers could look at your production table and then also look at these metrics and maybe like infer the quality of the data for their specific use case, right? And any data engineers in the crowd that are looking at this, you're thinking, no, 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 no. Like I've got to figure it out, right? And this is why data engineers are very valuable. Why, you know, they get paid the big bucks is because a lot of them do have very, very niche pipeline specific to uh, pipeline specific data quality checks and auditing. And they often work, right? Uh, the problem though is they're, they're different, right? They're a different design. Sometimes one engineer can have three or four different techniques that they apply to, you know, many different data sets in some combination, many different pipelines. So I'm going to talk about integrated audits, which is one design that comes with Iceberg. Um, it's not as popular as, as you would think, but hopefully, you know, after this talk, uh, you see it everywhere. I'll be great. Um, high level for anyone who's not familiar with the Apache Iceberg. This is how the docs describes it. Uh, so it's very long and, you know, huge analytic tables, list out engines, reliability and simplicity of SQL tables to big data. This is how I describe it. Massive scale cloud native SQL tables that can be accessed by many compute edges. Um, so that's the one liner that I think usually hits home for a lot of people. And I'm going to do just an overview on like what integrated audits is. So this is just the bullet slide on like what exactly this is. So um, integrated audits, they allow you to write your data to production in an unpublished state. And unpublished is bold there for a reason, right? Um, it automatically tags it with um, this spark.wap.id. Now, WAP is, stands for Write Audit Published. And in these examples, so uh, Spark is really where this has the main support for it, but these are using Iceberg primitives. So, so this entire feature is built into Iceberg and can be integrated to any compute engine. 
Spark is the one where it's fully supported and where I've seen it used at a really large scale. So a lot of this talk is Spark specific, but this is really a table property called wap.id that, that, that uh, is sort of um, how this is all sort of powered is, th is through those semantics. Um, uh, once you have the unpublished data in production that's tagged with your WAP ID, you can use uh, time travel, which is an iceberg feature that lets you query a table at any point in history. What it also allows you to do is query unpublished data. So if that data that exists in history, whether it's published or not, you can query it. So uh, this integrate audits pattern allows you to use time travel to select, to run select queries against that unpublished data. And then once you have confidence in the data, right, publishing is a metadata only operation. So this uses Iceberg's cherry pick feature, and it's very fast, as you can imagine, to be a metadata operation. There's some for like submitting the job, some overhead, but beyond all that, it literally is just a simple metadata operation. And then the downstream consumers can see that data. The important thing here is it's the exact same data, right? The file, the files are moved as part of this, right? And now, one of my favorite parts is if the data doesn't look good, you can just forget about it. All of the standard iceberg cleanup processes that happen, snapshot expiration, uh, you know, orphan file cleanup, all of those things will clean up unpublished data. Uh, so when you go through this process and that data ends up bad and you need to maybe change your pipeline and rerun it, you don't have to think about cleanup. That's just, you just forget it out of your mind and just know that the standards, because you're writing to the same table, the standard iceberg cleanup is... Uh, will handle cleaning all this unpublished data up. And so let's go in a little bit more detail there. And the way I think of it in my head is there are these three columns. Uh, there's staging the data, auditing the data, and publishing the data. So this is just more details on what is actually happening there, right? The previous one kind of listed out the features, but uh, with staging the data, first thing you do is there's a table property called write.wav.enable. And uh, you just have to set that to true um, that's a feature that sort of uh, uh, subscribes to this feature for the particular table, right? Uh, when that's set to true, you have to set this uh, set a UUID in your Spark session configuration. Uh, Iceberg will automatically pick that up and use that as sort of uh, the session ID for this uh, integrated audits uh, commit. And then you run your production ETL code. So your actual ETL code that you run after you do those two steps is actually your production ETL code. And it seems, it's, it's weird at first. It seems scary that like, well, I, my pipeline is writing to production and I, I'm running that pipeline, right? But uh, the, the broader semantics of um, setting the WAF ID, knowing that that's going to be published, that that's going to be unpublished, you have to really buy into that system and it works extremely well at large scale and you run the exact same production ETL code. So the questions of like, how can this scale, et cetera, is really if your ETL code can scale, if your writes are successful and that works, then once you opt into this, you're running the same exact code. And it's really just things on the outer edges like setting the, the session ID. And auditing the data is, I'll show both of these uh, same time, is you find the snapshot ID from your production table that's tagged with the UUID that you set. And then anything that can query your iceberg table, you can use to perform your validations. So if you if you want to run Spark queries, if you want to use something like Great Expectations, or you want to run use uh, Amazon's DQ or any auditing tool, even if you want to run custom stuff, as long as you can query runtime travel queries, uh, you can use that as your uh, auditing tool. And then publishing the data, right? Two scenarios, your audits fail, you just go back to the drawing board. You don't think about, oh, I have this unpublished data in my production table. It's not available to downstream consumers. They'll never be able to query that unless they specify that, look up that tag ID, which is a unusual thing that no, none of your downstream consumers, you know, who want your production data should do. Um, and you don't have to worry about cleanup. The standard iceberg exp snapshot expiration and um, processes will clean this up. And if your audits pass, you then just execute that metadata operation. So you perform that cherry pick. You have the snapshot ID, right? Because you looked it up by bit that, because it's tagged with the UUID, right? Uh, and there's an interesting thing to note here is that 
uh, when you t when you create generate the UUID at the beginning of the step, the snapshot ID doesn't exist yet, right? Because you haven't ran your your production code. And so I, a question I often get is like, well, why do you have to do this lookup here? And the reason is is because you generate that ID, then you run your production code, right? Uh, and then that production code generates the new snapshot of your table, right? Which is your table plus all the changes from your actual ETL. And the tag is used to look up what was actually written, what happened at the end of your ETL code. Uh, and then that's what you use here in the cherry pick uh, operation at the end. So it probably feels like this, right? Like, oh, there's a lot of, you know, it's just, so sound like it was going to be automated that you're just going to opt in and there are a lot of steps here. Uh, and I'm going to talk a bit at the end about like how you actually would pull this together with your orchestration system. Uh, but before I do that, I want to tackle this from another angle, right? Which is Iceberg is a data quality enabler, right? So it doesn't come with a opinionated, very specific auditing tool that allows you to define constraints and all these things based on the table format. What it does instead is it provides you the flexibility to inject any auditing tool. And if I look at this simple diagram, this is like data engineering workloads get more complicated than this, but generally you have some data source, you have your ingestion pipeline, and then you have your production data warehouse, right? And if something happens with the data source and like, you know, maybe you're reading a table and can't find it or the, you can't read it, something happens there, that's all right. You tell your downstream consumers, oh, if something's, the data source is ready or there's something going on with the data source, I'm, I'll, I'll let you know. I'll give you an update. That's fine. If your ingestion pipeline breaks without writing any of the data, right, your, your job fails in the middle for some reason. Well, you have all the beauty of uh, atomic commits from Iceberg, so none of your data is partially written, and, you know, the, the, the data is just delayed. Now, delayed data is always better than bad data, right? So the, the anxiety really happens right here is that <laughs> I don't want my ingestion pipeline to actually, there, there exists some issue in the data and it writes that to production, right? Because you might have, depending on the table, you might have 10, 20, 50, 100 downstream consumers who are already running their, their um, pipelines off of your data. And it's very hard to chase that down and find out oh, there was something wrong with data, please rerun all of your workloads. That's a big, big challenge. And that's where, where I think of it is that's where Iceberg integrated audits live. They live at that step, which is the, the right to production, right? Uh, so what that means is no more writing your data twice. You actually write it once to production. Uh, you don't have to remember to clean up things like test tables, uh, uh, you don't have to, uh, schema syncing, right? That's another thing. When you have the, the, the setup of, oh, I write my data to this test database location, and then I do some analysis, and then I rewrite it to prod, the more production tables you have that you use that design for, the larger your test database grows and keeping those schemas in sync, right? Someone adds a column to the prod table, or maybe you add a column to the prod table, and this happens too many times, you run the workflow and you say, hmm, that's interesting, it failed in test. And you have to remember, oh, there were schema changes and I have to apply those in test as well. Uh, so that's all gone. Uh, and you're not locked into a single auditing tool. So anything, again, anything that can access the iceberg table, anything that can run the audits and um, you can really, whatever logic you want to plug in there, it, all it needs to do is return a pass or fail signal. And, uh, this is another one too, no coupling of your ETL logic with your validation logic, right? So your ETL logic remains in change. It looks exactly as if you are writing to production, right? So the target table is your production table. Nothing changes about that. And your validation logic can live in whatever system, whatever tool that you're using that your really your orchestration system has to reach out to. And I'll talk about that uh, in a second, but essentially it's, you know, it's, it's all automated, right? All, all these, uh, you know, all these things, creating the test table, all that stuff is gone and it's automated just via this write, audit, publish pattern that Iceberg enables, which is writing your data unpublished. So we're going to get into now the orchestration system because it's a lot to remember, right? I have to remember to set, first of all, you have to generate a UUID. You have to uh, make sure it's in your Spark session configuration. And I mean, even that gives enough paranoia, right? Did I set my the my the the, the right 
that I set the WAP ID for this to make sure that it's a WAP run and not an actual production run. So where the automation usually happens is with the orchestration engine or the scheduler. I, sometimes I feel like those are interchangeable, even though I know there's, there's more to it. But uh, I have just a simple diagram with this orchestration engine on the left, your production table here, and then here it's one yellow diamond. Could be many. You could have three or four different, maybe a suite of tools that you run through. Uh, but, you know, to keep it simple, we just have one uh, a yellow diamond here. And I'm just going to walk through what the steps are that an orchestration engine has to handle in order to make this automated for the data engineer, right? For them to feel like this just works. So the first step is just, it has to verify that that's enabled. So that should happen when someone scheduling a job opts in to WAP, it has to verify that that's enabled on the table. And it's a very cheap operation. It just looks up a table property. So you can do that every time, right? Some people see, you know, I want to store the state of the table set. Don't do any of that. Just check it every time. Is this property set? If it's not, turn it on because this job is as, um, subscribed to be a integrated audits run. And the second part is just you submit the Spark application, but the orchestration engine should actually set that web ID for you in the session comp. Uh, the reason being is that the orchestration engine usually has some UUID for the job, right? For the Or the run, right? It has some run ID. Uh, and so it really can just set that Spark session comp when it schedules the job. Uh, uh, so that takes away two things so far, validating if the production table is enabled for WAP and then also having to set that in the Spark session configuration. So a data engineer comes along, schedules a Spark job, says this is a WAP enabled. And so these two steps are handled by the scheduling. Uh, once that is completed and that's written, and remember, because that Spark WAP ID is set, then the uh, it's unpublished. Even though it went to the production table, it's not actually published. The orchestration engine has that uh, information, right? It has the snapshot ID, has the UUID, and then it should trigger the, the audit, the data quality tool. When it triggers the data quality tool, uh, the data quality tool, sorry, actually the data quality tool can look up the, the snapshot ID, given the run ID, right? So the orchestration engine would say, hey, run these audits for this given uh, UUID. The auditing tool can look up the snapshot, um, and you can actually interchange that step, but the, the way I've seen it done is this way. Uh, you look up the snapshot ID for it, you run, you audit the unpublished snapshots. So you run your queries or run your analysis. And this, the auditing tool is usually an area where people can configure their audits, right? They can say, uh, you know, these valid, this column should exist within this number of bounds, uh, should be a normal distribution. And here's a lower and upper bound, right? Or something like this column should not have any nulls, all those things can be defined in this audit data quality tool. Your application doesn't need to know about it and the orchestration engine doesn't need to know about it. It just says, hey, trigger the audits for this for this particular ID. And then I'm going to come back to this step, but generally <laughs> the auditing tool just says publish or don't publish, right? Which is the equivalent of pass, pass or fail, right? These audits fail, don't publish, or these audits were successful, so publish the data, right? And then the engine can just run this um, data quality, this um, a cherry pick operation uh, once that's done. So this is usually, you see the orchestration engine has a big role here. There's a lot of arrows coming out of that. Uh, but, but this, because that generated run ID usually exists as part of the scheduling system, that's sort of the link that automates this whole process. So the data engineer can come and just say, well, here's my pipeline. I'm using, you know, I'm writing to these tables. Uh, here's the data quality tool that I'm using. And then you take care of the rest, right? Make sure these audits actions run. Now, this step five, uh, it doesn't seem like it, but that's where all the complexity lives. In, in five, it's never as simple as publish or don't publish the data. And what I mean by that is all uh, audits are not created equally. And what I mean by that is there are what the terms that, that I like to use is there are blocking audits, which are under no circumstances should the data be published if this audit fails, right? But then the caveat there is engineers, the number one request you're going to get is, I understand this is a blocking audit, but you know, I saw the blocking audit. I inspected the failure upstream. Don't make me run my job again. 
So you have to allow some mechanism to say, okay, this was a blocking audit. There's some user intervention there. They said, this is fine. They investigated it. And they have to allow, you, you have to find, the, the, allow some mechanism for them to publish that, even though it's blocking. And it's the idea of like, you know, a Saturday night, data engineer is out with his friends, having a great time or with her friends and they're having a blast. She gets an alert on her phone and she, ah, this audit failed. Inspects it, right? Like there's a lot of things you can look at now on your phone. Maybe goes to Slack, messages come. People get some confirmation, some solid confirmation. Presses a button, it's unblocked, and the data goes to production, right? And that's that's sort of the, the main uh, pattern that you'll see requested. But then there's also non-blocking audits, and this is the idea that well, we we add this check on the data. It's very noisy, and we expect it to fail every now and then, maybe even a couple times a week. We don't want it to block the data, right? The data should still go through, but we just want to be alerted of these failures. So five is where you get a lot of the complexity, right? Uh, how do you value, how do you weight different audits, right? People may even want combinations of, oh, well, if it fails to this degree, then don't publish the data. And they want a slider to say like how strong or how you know forceful an audit can be. So you can get very, very clever with step five. But that's really, um, the rest of this will really be automated and five will be the human intervention interface that will really um, uh, will really determine the value of this overall system, is step five. That's it. Um, there's a blog post. The blog post has a Docker image, um, has a Docker Compose setup that you can run. And it'll actually give you a Spark notebook with an integrated audits full run. So you can see like the uh, WAP ID getting set, the data being written, it queries and shows that it's unpublished, what the cherry pick looks like. You can see that end to end. And the blog also talks a little bit more detail uh, about these different steps. Um, reach out to us at Tabular. So we're building a data platform. Was, uh, I think you'll find it very interesting. There's a form there just... If you want to talk to us, fill it out, submit it. We'll get a notification and we'll reach out. Uh, and please join the Iceberg community. Even if, if you do anything with data and you're interested in the, in the uh, Iceberg space, the uh, community is growing. Iceberg adoption this year has been really strong. And so there's a lot of different uh, people from a lot of different communities, a lot of different organizations there. Uh, we have a sync about uh, every three weeks uh, that, that's open with an open agenda. If you can add any items there you want to discuss. And we use Slack, and then here's some of my uh, contact information. Yeah, that's it. So, questions? Yes. So, once you find out that uh, there is some junk in my data, so you have published and unpublished. So, unpublished is throw away everything. Yeah. As somebody inquired, what if I just want to cherry pick the good ones and throw away the junk? Yeah, that's a. Uh... See, I told you guys, step five would get gets complicated. Uh, you 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 could do that, although cherry picking. So if you if you assume like this ETL code is like one write job, right? You end up with one commit, and um, running like an iceberg, just trying to cherry pick like a portion of a commit is is very hard. It's very hard to know that, right? So um, so that would probably be the biggest barrier to doing to doing something like that. But what you could do is. If you were, had a job, for example, that was writing uh, to multiple partitions, you could publish certain partitions based on audit checks. So if you had something that ran in parallel, let's say, and it writes to an hourly partition and it's writing and it, you're backfilling an entire day, for example, you can have audits set up because these would be independent runs, right? You can have like independent runs, Iceberg, as long as you're writing to different partitions, Iceberg will handle that and will publish them even if it gets them in different order. So you could have integrated audits for each partition at the partition level. And then the ones that fail won't get published unless you hit the uh, accept button to publish them. Uh, and then the ones that have passing audits will fail. So you can, it's really about how you design the ETL part of it, um, more so than like the actual integrated audits feature giving you some granular control. I think that part is more difficult probably. Or maybe you can tie up your uh, check constant with the part descent. So. Exactly, yeah. So you're checking, and that's often what's done, right? You can parameterize what you're actually checking based on the partition. So, and that's the flexible part of that audit step, right? Because all it's giving you is a snapshot ID 
or the run ID. And you can actually, once you look up the snapshot, you can tell, okay, this, I'm just querying this snapshot. I'm just querying the new data that landed. And you can just have very specific, very intricate code there. This was a jam session. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, historically, the way that most EPL developers would do this would have a put table and a mat tables to track. It would be good for I spoke to fact uh, we had some sort of constraints on columns that are then forced and then automatically it would be time to put people some back tables because then rather than bringing sort of cherry picking off just a good rows or the good partitions to then get published and bad ones not, it would be just be easier for the spec itself to Figuring out a way to handle those constraints, uh, get the heated engines to enforce them, and automatically manage a good table and a bad table. Yeah. So that rejects could fit a table into a bad table, good records go into the table, and we don't message anyone unaffected. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I, I, there's a lot of potential there. The hardest part is the, the last part, having every compute engine like respect these constraints, and that, that's probably the, the more difficult part um uh but my previous talk the rest catalog i think will make that a bit easier as that as that grows uh to have sort of maybe a common interface you know added to the spec that can sort of understand constraints and column level requirements and those sort of things so yeah i think a lot of potential in this era for sure Constraints uh, change are easier uh at the column level uh the half uh there was a years ago there was a, a company for less might bridge uh, that was acquired by HP, and they used to do uh, uh, statistics on day-to-day -day basis as to every day in a financial transaction table, you expect 10 million transactions to total revenue of, you know, X, Y, Z, and even dollars. So, uh, we used to do comps and checksums and sums and totals and compare it to the earlier days uh, so that could allow or not at all. Uh, once again, difficult, but uh, if there is something that we evolved to do those kind of checks, uh, that would successful. It's hard to. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And these are kind of the primitives, I think, that get you kind of there, right? The ability to publish, the ability to write data unpublished, the ability to query unpublished data. There's sort of the primitives there. And uh, the Spark has basically done an implementation of you know, allowing some of these features. But yeah, the compute engine will play a huge role in, in, you know, in that. Look at the stats table that you talked about. Somebody talked about in the closure session, sorry, uh, and then decide to build a publish one. Absolutely. Uh, we got one here and then one in the back. Yeah. How How is the complexity handle beyond all published, no published rights with many concurrent rights? Like the you know, Iceberg has an opt-in currency where, as long as they don't, they'll cash are fine. But if you have an uh, unpublished right, and then someone else does a right that would class what happens there, and then how does the cherry bit get handled? How does all of the currency try to fight to enable people on the display? Yeah. So it's a great question. Uh, the the, for anyone who's used this system, and we use it a lot at, at Netflix, uh, the big thing that you'll hear uh, is you'll, a duplicate WAP commit exception. And so it'll catch that exception. You definitely won't have data squashed or, or anything. But if you do have multiple jobs that are right into the same partition, uh, that is a, a conflict uh, that will cause a conflict and it'll be caught. Uh, but you're right in that it doesn't actually like deconflict at a partition level. Um, yeah, that's, that's harder to, it's not impossible, but it, it's harder to do w right now. I think there's, there's a, there is potential there to have like some, something that actually looks at the two commits, but what's, what's hard there is, especially if someone's doing an overwrite, like you're overwriting a partition, what does it mean if you get two overwrites? Um, you know, and even if the audits passed individually and the overwrites do the audits pass when you, you know, combine them, right? So there's a lot of complicated things that can happen happen there but but we the to answer your question is it will catch the exception it, it will catch the conflict it won't resolve it but you'll you'll get that at the um at the cherry pick step at the end when you do the cherry pick uh, so you would see you find out that there was that conflict until there's until the cherry pick happens 
Yeah, so the write could actually, the write would happen. It would be unpublished, though. It wouldn't be available for downstream. But when you actually want to cherry pick that, uh, that I know, snapshot, it'll know that like this, uh, sorry, duplicate WAP is slightly different. Duplicate, it's this, uh, what I was describing. So duplicate WAP is if you try and duplicate with the same UU, if you try and commit with the same UUID. But to your point, even if you had two different uh, WAP commits. Like saying you have one on ultra records in, right. And before that gets resolved, we need another ultra records in, right. And then let's say that the second one gets cherry picked first and is going to conflict when you try to cherry pick the original one. Right. Right. So, so you would get a standard commit exception that, um, cause even, even taking this integrated audit system aside, right? If you were to make a commit directly, to, if two commits were to start, right? And this, I, I had a slide in the previous talk that would have been good here, but like, if you do two commits and they're different, uh, they're starting from the same point in the table, it's a race condition, right? So the first one that actually commits will succeed, but the second one will fail. So it'll be a failed commit because uh, the table has changed in between that process. So that's what you would see when you do the cherry pick is that when you act, now, if that's at a partition level, if they're writing to the same partition, that's when that conflict happens. But if it's different partitions, it would actually be smart enough to know that actually there was no changes to this specific partition and so it'll it'll apply. So, so you only find out when you try to cherry pick this. Whatever the last one right. that whatever the subsequent cherry picks are, you can point out at the ball. Yeah, exactly. And a typical situation where you can see this in action is when people do backfills. So if they say, oh, I'm backfilling for the past two years of data, it's a daily partition. So they're running whatever, 700 or so, like, you know, they finish at different times and they publish at different times. And even though they've all started at the same time, they're publishing to different partitions. And so all of those will just succeed, except for the ones where the audits fail, unless the data engineer skips it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we had one back here. I don't be the angel. They say it's part of the scene fell with data. I feel greatly said it to be that. What? It has already updated for the detail. Uh, the second part of the seed job is actually going to read the uh, seed made of just copying. Will it actually read the data, uh, this unpublished data? Or will it actually read the original data? In a way, is this a bad ideal job that's taken as a one single session? So whatever is happening is accessible, but not visible to outside world. Oh, he said. I should have included that in my slide, you, I, in my presentation. That was, that's a great point. It actually will detect and query the unpublished data. So the, the, the question, just to re, for anyone like, uh, so the, the question, let me just make sure I have it correct too, is that like if in the same ETL job, you're writing some data, but then you're reading from the same table, right? And you want to see that data you just wrote, but it's unpublished, right? So that the Spark WAP ID that you actually set is also honored for reads. So because it has that WAP ID set, when you do the read, you actually will get that unpublished data. So you can have an ETL that has many jobs that, you know, writes and then maybe reads from a table and you can have it sort of broken up. All of those will be considered one integrated audit session by that WAP ID and the cherry pick will actually publish the latest version of that snapshot, which is the result of those multiple reads and, and, and writes. Should I have that presentation? Any other other questions? Use ordinance for schema changes also. For schema changes? Um, I, it, sh it should work. I, I don't know to, because usually this is like automated as part of like something that runs on a schedule. And I think schema changes often don't run on a schedule, but it, it should work, right? The idea is that it won't publish it. So that a schema change won't be published, right? Because it's this is completely protected once you set it as a WAP run. So the schema change won't be published and you shouldn't have any issues cherry picking that schema change, uh, assuming it doesn't conflict with other changes. So if you had something for some reason that on a schedule does a schema change or, or even actually it doesn't have to be scheduled, right? If you want to do this once, but you actually just want to try it first to prod and then query it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That, that would work. But the schema change would update the Hadoop control or whatever control you have to say. So readers would actually see. Yeah, it would It would update the metadata, right? It will write the new metadata and then it will update the pointer in the catalog to point to the new one. Yeah. 
So a cherry pick actually is a creates a new commit. So um, it's a little bit different. I would get you cherry pick and you see that commit, but this actually uh, will create the new version of the metadata and write that. And then it will go and update the pointer to say, here's now the latest version of the table. So that's all handled as part of the cherry pick operation. Okay. Okay. So even the schema chain board not we see. Yeah. And, th and that's actually what, what I'm going to say unpublished in this, what we actually mean is it doesn't update the pointer in the catalog. Right? That's really the core thing. I mean, like the metadata is there, this version of the table is there, but the actual pointer in the catalog is never changed until you run your audits. And it gives you sort of that space to run your, your audits. So is it possible to query the unpublished data from a different query engine? For example, setting the snapshot ID for the table scan for the unpublished snapshot? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the, the common one that we that I saw at Netflix was you'd uh, write Spark, so usually batch ETL and Spark, and then you'd query it with Trino. Uh, so your audits, because you know you want to cover those fast queries, you would uh, use Trino, uh, query it, run your all your checks there, and then um, hand off to the orchestration engine to actually do the the commit. And it, again, so the, there was there was another library as well too that sort of wrapped those Trino calls to make it a bit declarative. I think that's the big key here is for the what we've seen is like for the data engineers you want it to be declarative because. You know, writing SQL to query the, uh, to run the audits is, it works and we've all done it, but you come and look at the SQL six months later and you don't even remember what you were checking for. So you often want, and that's, that's why that flexibility is nice because like in Netflix, we had a, a custom library called data auditor where you can actually declaratively say this column should not have nulls or it's sort of what you were saying, where you would describe these constraints of the table. And we had like very complicated ones too, where you can set like t uh, different uh, standard deviations for uh, the upper bound and lower bound, and they should fit within this. And so it, you can, tons of complicated things. We have a library called Snitch where you can run like advanced like anomaly detection and all that just plugs right in at that integrated audit section. Um, but you, you do want something to make the auditing definition like clear and easy to do for, for, um, uh, and also other people can contribute it too, right? That was something that I think wasn't as common, but is an opportunity there where like your downstream consumers can come and say, I'm going to add an audit, right? Like yeah. you, you're not checking for nulls in this column, but I know that there shouldn't be nulls in this column. So I'm going to add it, right? You would never let, a data engineer would never let them come and like muck with their ETL code, right? Like, I don't know this person is one of the people who use my table. They're, they're coming in there. They want to change my ETL code. That never works, right? But if the auditing system is separate. People can define these audits and uh, you can just add them to your table, right? And then it'll sort of just happen, just work. Best case scenario. Any other other questions? We need a metadata when you pull the audits. I don't, know if, I don't know if that's captured in the snapshots table. Yeah, the audit, the, yeah, the, Maybe history table has, I don't know. Yeah, I think it just has the web ID and it has whether that yeah. was published, but like that's, yeah, right. that's a good point. That's a great point, right? Like to want to remember the new ID, so. Yeah, yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah, you could always look up the snapshot, but there's no place to like drop the, the meat of the audit, right? Like what actually happened. Yeah, it's a good point. Usually there's another system and you have to like get the ID the WAP ID from the history, yeah, the history table, and then like tie that back to some other systems. All right, that's it. Thanks everyone. I appreciate you talking.